welcome to the Dr. Frankavilla Show. I'm your host, Dr. Carolyn Frankavilla, board certified family physician and diplomate with the American Board of Obesity Medicine. I've been helping patients lose weight to treat and prevent medical problems for the last 10 years, and I'm taking what I've learned from them to you. In this podcast, you will learn the science behind why you struggle with your weight and what to do about it, tips for common challenges, work to fight bias about what a healthy weight really is, and improve your relationship with food and your body. Please remember that while I'm a doctor, I'm not your doctor. This podcast is meant to be informational in nature only, not medical advice. Please seek out care from your physician for your specific needs. Okay, let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to this week's episode of the podcast. I have a guest with us here today. And we are going to be talking a little bit more about menopause today, but even if you feel like that subject is maybe not for you, maybe you have long since experienced menopause, or maybe you are someone who is not going to be in menopause for a long time or ever, I think you're still going to get some stuff from this episode because there is some great information coming your way. So welcome, Dr. Susan Baumgartel. Ah, sorry, I tried. Um, an internal medicine physician with 30 years of experience. She founded her business, My MD Advocate, in 2022, transitioning from in person clinical medicine to virtual medicine in the advocacy arena. While the 2020 pandemic raged, her innate creativity blossomed, launching the Menopause Menu, a free resource and blog website provided nourishing support for menopause and beyond. She also collaborates with people all over the globe on podcasts, live stream lectures, and other venues, educating everyone about menopause and midlife, always front and center. And she has just written her first book, The Menopause Menu, which we are going to talk a little bit about today. When she is not writing or doing patient consultations, she can be found volunteering for the Cancer Lifeline, a regional nonprofit optimizing quality of life for all people. She lives in Seattle with her husband of 32 years and is a proud mom to a daughter serving as an officer in the U.S. Navy. I love it. Thank you for your family's service. I really appreciate that. So thank you for joining us today. And I am excited to talk about your book, The Menopause Menu, which, uh, by the way, let me just say I love. It is a really fun format. It has lots of quotes. It has art. It has recipes. And it has really easy to understand, digestible information. And we're going to go into some that's most related to my topic of of weight and health today. And you know what my favorite little surprise in this book was, was the menopause bingo. I love that part. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, what a, what a fun way. So you, if you want to know what menopause bingo is, you're going to have to check out the book so you can see this menopause bingo. But tell us a little bit about like what inspired you? Why did you decide to write this book? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is so wonderful. And um, I'm glad that it's inspiring you. Really, you know, 30 years, gosh, I can't believe I've been a doctor for 30 years. I reflect on my career and all of the female patients that I have been taken care of in their like 30s and all the way to, you know, early 60s and other age groups too. And this big group kind of trying to navigate their midlife journey. And, you know, so many times uh, I would be asked the question like, oh, what book should I read or what website should I go to? And, you know, there are some good ones, but there really wasn't kind of the resource I wanted to recommend because, you know, I wanted something that was very accurate, but straightforward, but didn't dumb it down. And it was always hard to kind of get that combination. I'm very much a believer in science, but I also believe in the kind of holistic support. So getting that combination was also important to me. I think, you know, in general, many women still are frustrated by physicians not always taking their symptoms seriously right? Or just the medical system is fragmented and it just doesn't allow the physician time to spend with their patients. And maybe their question is tagged on at the very end of a long visit, they're already going over. And so there's no time. And, you know, everyone, you don't have to be in medicine. I mean, everywhere you look, it seems that menopause is in the mainstream media, you know, it's New York Times or Washington Post or wherever you go, local news station, there's a story of menopause, maybe it's menopause in the workplace. And so I think we're, we're now kind of bringing this into the forefront And that stimulated me to think of like, wow, how could I produce something that would be helpful for women, not just women, but men and anyone who supports a woman who's everyone knows someone going through menopause, right? And so to me, it was also something that I wanted to do in a very collaborative spirit. And so I had other kind of people that I wove into the texture of the book. 
And again, this kind of what I created was really not a manual. It wasn't something like a, a scientific uh, article where you had to look up every other word or uh, you had to read from A to B to C to D, you know, in order. You could really maybe read for five minutes or the old fashioned coffee table books. They just kind of open and enjoy a page. So or almost like a magazine in some ways, right? <laughs> where it's like you don't necessarily have to go in an order. Um, you're yeah. not missing out. And then, yeah, really, really fun and engaging. And, you know, I totally agree that we have ignored women's health a lot in general, but largely menopause and perimenopause, which is, you know, something I feel like people weren't even talking about a few years ago. And yeah. I have a great episode with Dr. Becky Lynn. It was a couple months ago. So if anyone wants like all the details on menopause and a little bit more of a scientific bent, go check out that episode. But today I think I love your approach of, you know, we're, we're going to use science, right? We're not going to sell you voodoo and, and tell you things that are, are not true, but there's a lot about listening to your body, right? And, and that everyone's experience, whether it's with weight or with cancer or with menopause is going to be different, right? And so like use science where we can, but at the same time, recognize people's experiences are going to be completely different. So when we, one of the topics that comes up for my patients is weight gain that occurs in menopause. And you definitely tackle that right on in, in your book. What should women expect when it comes to weight with menopause? And, you know, what are some of the explanations for why that happens? Yeah. Oh boy. That is such a loaded question. It could be like a whole hour show, but I feel like when you step back and look what's happening, menopause or that menopausal journey, this is midlife, right? Most women are midlife or approaching midlife. And, you know, midlife, I think is a time to think about all those different kind of things that are happening. Maybe if you have kids, maybe they're fleeing the coop, you know, you're becoming an empty nester. If your parents are still alive, maybe they're, you know, older, or maybe there's illness involved. Maybe you have a chronic illness or some, something, you know, a health concern that's going on. Maybe you have a change in your job or your marriage. I mean, just, there's a lot of things happening. And I think when you really peel back the layers, that kind of feeds into all those things that I think of as important for impacting weight. So maybe your exercise routine is different. Maybe your nutritional intake is different. Oh yeah, I'm sure your stress is different. Uh, better, worse, different. Maybe your sleep is different. You know, all those things and maybe social connection too. Those are so key when you think about weight. I think our kind of, we've catapulted into amazing uh, territories now with new drugs and new developments in the pharmaceutical industry, helping people manage weight, especially when it relates to diabetes. But I think if you steer away from that for a moment, there's still so many parts of that puzzle that are uh, important to pay attention to. When it comes to menopause, you know, what's happening? It's a very hormonal thing, right? Your estrogen levels are declining or getting quite low. So your circulating estrogen levels are not there. And that is really part of the puzzle when you think about like increasing abdominal, visceral, you know, fat. God knows why it's in the middle, right? And right. That, that there very is like, you know, there's all these other things, but there is also yeah. hormonal changes that are happening, right? Where right. women will tend to lose muscle mass. So we yeah. lose muscle and yeah. we, you put weight around the belly during menopause. Yeah. And this yeah. doesn't mean it's going to happen to everyone, but it's a pretty common um, biological thing that is happening with these hormone changes when your hormone levels start to go down with menopause. Yeah. And then, you know, you mentioned the decreased lean body mass, and that could be also partly worsened if you're not doing so much physical activity and that might adding to the sleep disruption and you toss in stress. It's like this perfect recipe yeah. for weight gain. Yeah. So I think that that's a, a great way to think of it, right? Is there's probably going to be some body composition change for most of us during menopause, right? It's just a normal part of aging and menopause to lose muscle mass and gain some weight often around the midsection. And then there's things that are going to add to that. There's the stress, there's the poor sleep that often goes along with menopause. There's all these life changes, energy changes. Maybe it's harder to work out all the things that add to that, that can make it a a more significant experience for, for some women than for others. 
Definitely. Yeah. And I think it's a confusing time period because again, you know, where a typical woman is getting her information from can impact kind of what's, what she's going to think about doing. And so I, you know, I, I hate the word diet. It's like a four letter word. I, I talk about nutrition differently, but you know, yeah. so it, it's very easy to kind of think, oh, if only I ate this, or if only I did that, or if I worked out more, if I didn't, you know, and, and it's never that linear. I mean, yes, of course, nutrition is important. Of course, exercise is important, but I think you have to look at the fundamental, like what's the reason for why Absolutely. this is happening. Absolutely. Right. And you talk in your book about like addressing those underlying things, right? Working on stress, working on sleep, you know, all those things. And that those are there to just make you feel better, right? Like in weight loss, one of the things you mentioned a few times in the book is weight loss is often a side effect of doing those things. And, yeah. and I think, you know, I'm an obesity physician. So I, I, you know, I treat weight. That's what I do. And, but one of the things I always emphasize with my patients and I try to emphasize on the podcast, is there a reason you need to lose weight? So you may have gained 10 pounds in menopause. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 30. And that of course can be really bothersome in many ways from just having to buy new clothes to feeling different. And, and we'll get into the body image thing here in a second, yeah. but uh, that may or may not be impacting your health, right? So your blood work may still look great. You still may be hiking all weekend and biking and able to touch your toes and you you feel great. And so, so what if you have another 10 pounds on you, if it's not impacting your health, right? Now, for some women, you gain 10 or 15 pounds, all of a sudden your blood sugar is high, your cholesterol is high. Okay, we need to, to do things, yeah. but the yeah. weight is not necessarily the whole story, right? It's right. really focusing yeah. on, on the health. Yeah, that number on the scale shouldn't drive your decisions, but you know, it kind of does. Well, I wanted to let you know, and maybe you know this, but I ran a program, I developed a program and ran it for seven years. It was called Mini for Change. And it ran from 2012 through 2019. It started off as a weight management program, mostly women, people come in, they wanted to lose weight, but it gradually morphed to not just weight, but more of a wellness program. And I really do mean that in all senses. I hire naturopathic docs, nutritionists, uh, acupuncturists, exercise physiologists, psychotherapists. We had all these kind of supports in place and it was really a beautiful program. Sad to see it. I sunsetted it myself because we had a transition and kind of the corporate takeover of our company. <laughs> Long story. But you know, the one pearl, and you echoed it before, was weight loss should be a side effect of a bigger health journey, not the end goal. And I think that is the secret sauce, because if you focus on those other things, weight loss almost always, unless we're talking about a genetic or a predisposition or familial or problem that's really a kind of medical based, weight loss follows. And it was such a pleasure to see it happen, to kind of support women who are in, in this program to kind of see that and to develop these personalized kind of individual approaches, because it is all very uh, individual, isn't it? Yes. And you have like a little patient vignette in the book where you talk about a woman and she comes back and she hasn't lost very much weight. She's like, oh, things aren't going that well. I've lost weight. And you, you check in with her about all these symptoms. Well, how's your sleep? How's your energy? How are you feeling? I don't know. Uh, reflux is what I see a lot from patients. Check in on all these symptoms and they're all great and she feels amazing. And you're like, well, I think our job here is done, right? Like, you know, like that was the goal, right? And so I think that doesn't mean you can't lose weight, you can't try to lose weight, but focus on those health goals and, and losing weight for the sake of losing weight is often a very frustrating and emotionally draining experience. Right. And the one thing, and that was one of my favorite parts too, uh, from that program, one of the things too, is that many people who have eating disorders or have food issues behavioral issues, even long before menopause, it kind of, you sprinkle menopause into the mix, you know, it just kind of augments that. And so you have this very complicated package. And that's why people like you who are devoting themselves to helping people work with obesity and treatment of obesity. There's so many layers you have to look yes. at, and it's not just a, you know, that's why any book is not just going to sing the song and tell you exactly what you need to do. That's a bunch of woo woo. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's someone trying to make money. <laughs> yeah. And so that's a, I think a pretty good transition to this topic of body image. And so what I'll see for my patients is 
I'll often see someone who was pretty happy with their weight. Maybe they were a normal BMI or they were just in a place where they were really comfortable. They'd maintained their weight for most of adulthood and they maybe hadn't put that much thought into it. They ate a generally healthy diet. They moved and, and did exercise that they enjoyed. And then all of a sudden menopause hits and they find this change in body distribution and they may see that the scale has gone up, you know, 10, 15, 30 pounds, maybe more. And it's really emotional for them. They're like, yeah, yeah, but I, you know, I was always 140, like I'm 160 now. Like, you know, this isn't okay. I need to be back at 140. And how do you have that discussion when someone would say, you know, but I used to be this. And how do you, how do we reframe that discussion? Yeah. Oh, that is so important. And I'm glad you asked. I think, first of all, a lot of listening has to happen. You have to feel like, you know, where are they? What are their values? It could be social, cultural, familial, heredity. I mean, what, what makes them tick? What, what are they focused on? Why? I think uh, most people would nod their heads. We women are our own worst critics, especially during this perimenopausal phase. You know, we don't like this little roll of fat or we don't like, you know, what, what our skin's doing. And the self-criticism doesn't help. So I think it may sound a little too easy, but pulling back and reminding everyone who's kind of in that slump or in that kind of, oh, I can't do this, that menopause should be thought of as this midlife journey, a time to cultivate that inner wisdom. And I really do mean that in all of its senses, opportunities to redefine what body image means, you know, reclaim their strength. It could be personal strength, it could be physical strength. Uh, could be emotional, spiritual uh, strength. And then, you know, honestly, uh, boy, the older we get, we should start to cast aside those societal norms, you know, the stick thin raw models. I see someone walking down a runway. Oh yeah, I'm not judging them, but they don't look healthy to me. They look really stick thin, you know? So live with gusto, kind of reclaim that and really focus on those things that make you feel good, not just look good. You know, the physical fitness part. I always feel good when I've exercised. Maintaining that mental sharpness. Maybe it's time to, to learn a new language or learn art. Do, do something creative. Get that other side. Uh, chronic disease, manage that is, is, I think, key because that can also play into this body image if you have things that affect what you look like. Uh, and just really being the best steward of your body. I think just those simple, honest, heartfelt reminders are important to share. Uh, I like this idea of thinking about it as a, a transition, almost a new beginning, right? It's a new, it is marking a new chapter in life. And for me, a time that resonates like that is, was pregnancy, which not everyone goes through, but that is um, an experience where my body changed a lot and my body in many ways, you know, didn't go back to the body it was before. Right. <laughs> and that can be something, especially with mainstream media, we see celebrities who look just the same way they did before they had a baby. And it's like six weeks after they had a baby and somehow they're this fountain of youth. And I think in the real world, you can spend a lot of money and a lot of effort to continue on that journey. And some people just have luck and will have this fountain of youth in no matter what they do. But I think recognizing our body's going to change at different times. And yeah. sometimes it's something we might expect like a pregnancy or that we can anticipate like right. menopause. And sometimes it's something we can't predict, right? Like, like right. a surgery or, or another right. health condition that affects our body. And so if we get too tied to what our body looks like, we're missing out on other experiences in life. Yeah. And when you think about the industry, so to speak, you know, all the support that's in place for a woman who is having a child, the books, uh, you know, the, the support, you know, the medical systems, everything's really in place and society's in place. But we don't have the same for women going through menopause. Right. Well, you we know, kind of celebrate becoming a mother, right? Like, it's <laughs> like you're in a club now. We're like, oh, yeah. you're, you know, congrats. You're a mom. Yeah. Like, it's the most wonderful thing, right? Yeah. There's all this positivity often around right. that. But maybe for another transition in women's life, like menopause, it's yeah. something often we just don't talk about. Instead right. of, I, I just, right. I love your mindset of embracing it. Like, this is a transition and it means different things. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think it, it was, and maybe, gosh, might still be in some circle almost a taboo subject. You didn't oh, talk sure. about the changing of the periods or the vaginal dryness or the libido or all those things. Now I think we're able to embrace that. And sometimes, honestly, you need a sense of humor too. <laughs> oh, 
that great for anything, right? They shouldn't say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Like a, a laugh a day keeps the doctor yeah. <laughs> away, right? You, you know, having a sense of humor, which I think like hot flashes are a, a really bizarre, unique experience for most women. And I think that's a time where, you know, often women will cope with it uh, by humor, right? Just making light of it because you can't yeah. stop it necessarily, right? So um, right. embrace it and, and make fun of it a little bit. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> So speaking of hot flashes and night sweats, one thing that I saw in your book that I thought was a great topic was the effects of exercise and alcohol um, and how those can impact night sweats. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So exercise, and I'm really thinking of the cardiovascular, you know, getting your heart rate up and your blood pumping daily cardiovascular exercise can really improve kind of what we call the, the thermoregulatory control. That's in the hypothalamus, you know, the brain activity that is kind of helping to control your thermostat. So your temperature, the challenge is, of course, you don't want to exercise right before bed because then that might hype you up and that's not going to help night sweats at all. And I'm not sure about the science behind that. I've just heard it with so many patients that experienced it myself, but I think probably there's an impact on the vascular integrity. You know, what's a hot flash you know, it's dilation of those blood vessels close to the skin. And so there's probably a shift in how that's, that mechanism's working. So that's one point. The alcohol, oh, I've heard this so many times and I've even experienced it myself. Really, I think it, it's more indirect, frankly. I think it disrupts the quality of sleep. And then mm -hmm. in that sense, that may change how your body's core temperature is being reset, or maybe it's impacting uh, hormone fluctuations. I mean, there's a lot there, but I've had so many women who have temporarily kind of gone off alcohol and like 80% decrease in their hot flashes, night sweats, and pretty impressive. Other things that are just good for your health, right? Like moving is going to be good yeah. for our health either way, right? So if you get this bonus that you are now improving your night sweats, then great, right? But probably no harm in moving on a daily basis either way. You know, we get a both benefit. And we talked about alcohol a little bit on the podcast as well, and probably very minimal health benefits. So I think with interventions like increasing exercise or cutting alcohol, those are things that probably have other health benefits too. I've certainly talked about exercise many times on the podcast. It is just great for health in general. It is very powerful for maintaining weight. Um, and so like, you know, lots of reasons to move more. And if it helps hot flashes, great, right? And if not, you're getting other benefits from it. And then same right. thing with alcohol. In the last few years, we've really seen a lot more data that alcohol probably has very minimal, if possibly no health benefits and probably more health risks than we realized. And so, yeah. you know, also a really reasonable thing to try. Like, how do you feel not drinking for a month or two? Like, if you feel amazing, then the, the answer for you, they're right. You know, don't, don't drink. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have less hot flashes, you might feel better. So those are things you can experiment with with your own body and see how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. So true. I think it's good not to preach, but to say, these are good examples. Why don't you try it? <laughs> yeah, it, you should try it, right? There's certainly no harm in cutting back yeah. on alcohol unless you're at a place where you're truly dependent on it. One of the things I noticed in your book with the recipes is that they are all plant-based recipes. Um, do you find that plant-based diets are something that are particularly helpful for menopause? Well, I'm an omnivore, so I eat everything, but actually I, once you mentioned, it, I thought like, oh gosh, except for there's, there's salmon in one of the dishes, but yeah, I, I do think honestly, plant-based nutrition is healthy for so many uh, conditions, just good for, for normal health and aging and probably was good for menopause related health too. I don't think you have to exclude everything, but I think it's a good goal to move towards or kind of partly move towards. Honestly, I think the field of culinary medicine is kind of taking off. And I think it's teaching us a lot about the connection between what we eat and our physical and mental health. So there's a lot there that I think is really exciting. I know a lot of folks who've actually gotten specialty training in culinary medicine and are really doing a great job learning and, and, and teaching. And so I think that we're continuing to get information about what it means to eat in a certain way to support, uh, we already know about diabetes, but other kind of chronic illnesses. Um, one example from my book was actually, I think from the first chapter, uh, miso soup with tofu, green onions, and seaweed. And so if you picked out a part, you know, um, 
tofu contains uh, phytoestrogens, so plant-based or plant source of estrogens, it kind of mimics uh, what the body's estrogen would be like. Um, and that may favorably impact hormone levels. Um, obviously, I'm not saying just eat tofu five times a day, because maybe that's what you'd have to do to have a strong impact, but why not include it? That there's right. some good if, if soy there. is something um, that you enjoy, yeah. um, if tofu is something that, that you like, having a serving of that on a regular basis, like yeah. it may give you some symptoms because it's that phytoestrogen, right? So yeah. it's got a little bit of an estrogen effect. So you may get some symptom relief yeah. and, and adding a little bit more of that. Yeah. Likewise, you know, miso, it's from soybeans and, and there's um, kind of the isoflavone component in, in certain beans, including soybeans. And so that can potentially reduce hot flashes. And miso also kind of has the probiotic component that can support your gut health. So, you know, it gets back to that, like you said, you know, the bigger picture of supporting health, not just that so you're trying to gun a certain uh, symptom and, and get and obliterate it. But I think the more of that you include, maybe it's fun for your palate. Maybe it's tasty. Maybe it's fun to eat. Maybe you learn new recipes. Gosh, maybe get some calcium or some protein. You, know, you can kind of get other things in there too. And I think that's really the fun part of thinking about nutrition, not just like do this or don't do that. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. I really encourage my patients to figure out what works for their body, right. To pay attention. And so if you're like, you know, I've been eating, you know, this miso soup on a regular basis and it seems like I feel better on the days I do great. Like keep eating it. Right. I was sharing with you before the show that I cut out dairy several years ago and I happened to discover that I had a beneficial side effect if I didn't get any pain or cramping with my periods. And so for me, I discovered that's how my body responded to that particular food and and it was very easy for me to limit my intake yeah. of dairy when I knew I felt better, right? And I certainly don't go around recommending that everyone cut dairy out of their diet. It's a great way to get protein and calcium um, for many people. But I think experimenting with our bodies, right? And, and yeah. seeing like, how do I respond? You know, if you've always been interested in a plant-based diet, maybe you try it for a couple of weeks and see how you feel. And if you don't notice any different, then, you know, no reason to strictly stick to that way of eating. But if some of these changes make you feel better, like why not do them? Yeah, no, I think trial and error is legitimate. And what works for one person may not work for you. And I get back to the whole concept of not shoulda, coulda, woulda, but like, is it enjoyable? How does it make you feel? Do you like it? You know, and so it's not just uh, following instructions. And I think that that should, you know, I want women, especially in menopause to feel like they have the liberty to try things and not to feel like there's one way to do anything. Cause that's not life. Is it? <laughs> I love it. That's so perfect. That's that's all about, you know, we talk about weight and health. It's all about figuring out what works for you because look, if there was one solution to menopause or to weight or to just living a long, healthy life, like we, we would be telling everyone about it, right? Like no one would be keeping it secret. So anyone who tells you they have that one right path, like they're, they're probably a little bit full of it, right? <laughs> So true. So true. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. If people want to find your resources, find your book, where can they find you? Yeah. Well, uh, the books, the, the short title is The Menopause Menu. Uh, long title is Menopause Menu From Hot Flashes to Delicious Dishes, A Symptom Driven Nourishing Guide to Mastering Menopause. I love that. It's available on Amazon or if you're in my Seattle neighborhood, we have events locally. My website, my professional website is mymdadvocate.com and my free informational website on menopause is menopausemenu.com. And there's lots of goodies there too. And there's a link for the book. So I'm always happy to correspond with anybody. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And until next week, take care. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Frank Avila Show, where we learn about all things related to weight and health. If you love this podcast, make sure to leave those five-star reviews and share this podcast with a friend or loved one. If you have a topic about weight and health you want me to tackle, head over to the website, thedrfrankavillashow.com to submit your question. And make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss next week's episode. Take care.